You're listening to The Thrive Podcast, where every week we dive into a practical, tactical tip to bring you from a life of simply surviving to thriving. It's personal development for the everyday girl who is done with coasting through her days, done with feeling like she's missing out on the deeper meaning of her own life, and done with mediocrity once and for all. Because it's not enough to simply survive, you deserve to thrive. Welcome back to Thrive. If you've ever found yourself staring wistfully out the window of your nine to five, wondering, is this really for me? Or even knowing that you were meant for more, but feeling unsure of how to make that brave jump, you are going to love today's episode. Adam, who goes by Smiley Pazwalski, is a TED Talker, motivational speaker, book author, and millennial workplace expert with so much incredible insight into A, how to break through a quarter life crisis, and B, how to better connect as millennials and as people, especially in transitioning through such a weird Zoom age. Stay tuned through this conversation. Drop it five stars if you like what you're listening to. And without further ado, welcome Smiley. Hi, Erica. It's great to be here today. Yeah. Okay. So we almost got into this before hitting record, but I didn't want to steal your thunder. So first things first, have to know, where did the nickname Smiley come from? So Smiley Smiley is actually a nickname from high school. So I've had it almost 20 years at this point. Um, But I went out for the cross cross country team, which was a sport that I didn't even know what it was freshman year of high school. Um, I definitely was not big enough to play football. Um, (laughs) Our our soccer team was really, really good. One of the best teams in the state. And pretty much one of the only other high school sports in the fall was cross country. So I was like, okay, I'll go out for cross country. And all you do is run. You just Yup. I also do cross country. So (laughs) I could, I feel your pain. (laughs) Um, So we, you know, we're, we're running and we're doing a hill workout. One of the first couple of weeks of practice and I'm running up and down the hills, which is just a hill workout is you just run up and down the hill over and over. (laughs) That's all it is. And I'm running up and down the hills, kind of smiling. (laughs) Don't worry about that. (laughs) Just fell over. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> everything's cool um running up and down the hills kind of smiling and my coach is this boston guy and he's like what the hell are you doing smiling kid stop <laughs> smiling stop puking stop puking kid so the team nicknamed me the, and my coach nicknamed me smiley after that and the nickname kind of just stuck that's hilarious i know when we do cross country we got shirts made that said our sport is your sports punishment <laughs> <laughs> exactly. we, we thought we were so cool <laughs> It's a pretty hardcore sport, actually. Oh, absolutely. It's like, it doesn't get enough credit. It's really, it's really intense. But I mean, hey, that's awesome. (laughs) Cool. So I'm excited to hear all about you. So you're a motivational speaker, TED Talker, author, millennial workplace expert, which is quite a cool title, (laughs) might I add. And you've basically been featured like everywhere from the New York Times to Cosmo to the World Economic Forum. Washington Post, like all of the places. So introduce everybody to who you are and what you do and how the heck you ended up becoming the millennial workplace expert. Sure. Um, so I got started in this kind of millennial world, <laughs> as, as I call it, uh, about nine years ago. So I was working for the United States Peace, Peace Corps, which is a government agency in Washington, D.C., And I had a really great job on paper. Um, I was working for one of the senior officials at the agency. I had a pretty good salary, healthcare benefits, job security, kind of all the things you're looking for in a job after college. So on paper, everything was perfect, but except I was pretty miserable. (laughs) I didn't really like my job. And like many young people and millennials was kind of struggling with, hey, what does it look like to find meaningful work? What if everyone else is impressed with your job, but you hate it? What do you do? So I eventually ended up quitting my job in 2012 um, after um, being stuck in a very big quarter life crisis for a long time. And I started writing about my quarter life crisis on my blog. I had a WordPress blog that I paid $18 a year for. And I started (laughs) writing about what I was going through. And it really resonated with a lot of people, this kind of search for meaning and purpose and community and kind of not the traditional signpost for success. And I started doing a lot of research and realizing, hey, I'm not alone in being a millennial that is looking for something other than just a salary, a job, 
you know, a 401k success when you get to the age of 65 and like, you're supposed to retire and be able to play golf or something. And I was like, <laughs> no, I actually want happiness. Now I want to find meaning in my life. Now I want to surround myself with believers. Now um, I'm looking for a little bit of a deeper career fulfillment. And so my writing, I think really resonated with people. And I was first and foremost writing about my own experience, but then also interviewing other young people going through the exact same thing I was. And I turned that into a book, uh, The Quarter Life Breakthrough, which I actually originally self-published and it sold nearly 10,000 copies. So that was a, it was a pretty uh, incredible uh, experience of, you know, what happens when you put yourself out there, when you go for something, when you try something new, um, and you know, the power of, of putting of, of kind of putting your intention into the world and also kind of being honest about what you're looking for. And that was the beginning of my entrepreneurial journey. It was the beginning of my writing journey, my speaking journey. And I started writing more and more about millennials and realizing that there was a lot of interest that a lot of, you know, I wasn't alone. Uh, millennials make up more than 50% of the workforce. Um, some statistics say that in the next five to 10 years, they'll make up nearly 70% of the workforce because of the shifting demographics and so many baby boomers retiring. So it was the right time for that idea. And that's kind of how I launched my career. And, um, realizing that, you know, writing for those of you that write is very great way to get your ideas out there, but is not a great way to make money. <laughs> um, it's more of a calling card. It's more of building your audience. It's more of communicating your ideas, connecting with readers, meeting other people. Uh, but speaking was actually how I made a living and that there was a lot of interest on the company side in terms of attracting, retaining and engaging millennial talent. Um, as, as many people will know, including myself, right? Millennials sometimes don't like to stay at their jobs. Now I had stayed at my job two and a half years. So that's a good amount of time, but millennial turnover, when people leave their jobs after three months or six months, they've actually cost us companies $30 billion a year. So turnover is a really, uh, big problem. And mm -hmm. it's a high, one of the highest costs that a lot of companies face. It's so costly to, you know, go out and hire someone and train them and, do all the recruiting and then have them leave after a few weeks. They're like, yeah, this is great. And then they just bounce. See ya. <laughs> so I was trying to help companies kind of figure out how do we keep people happy? How do we uh, make them more engaged, more productive, more excited to be at work? How do we create a kind of more healthy purpose-driven workplace? So that's been the focus of uh, uh, my work over the past eight or nine years. Yeah, no, that's awesome. And I'm glad that you mentioned that you have had a quarter life crisis because I know some people might actually recognize your name or your voice from your TED talk because it has over what one and a half million views right. um, all about the quarter life crisis. So since you mentioned it, I love when people are willing to kind of break down their lows also because oftentimes we lead with our highs like obviously we led with you know you were in the new york times and you do all these incredible things and you started your own business and you're killing it but i love that you also mentioned that you've had that that low of having the quarter life crisis would you mind going into a little bit what did that actually look like for you how did you feel in the moment and like what made you think like oh dang this is a quarter life crisis like i'm having it Right. So people always ask, like, how do you know you just if you're actually having a quarter life crisis? Yeah, and I always equate it to if you have physical pain. So I actually, you know, had trouble sleeping, I would have kind of some panic attacks, I actually got shingles on my side. Shingles is That's gross. Brutal. I don't know if anyone's ever had it. It's as gross as what it sounds like. But it's actually a nerve disease that's often related to stress. And it's common among people over the age of 70 not 20 somethings. So I was about 28, 29 at the time when I had my quarter life crisis. So I was a little late, you know, some people have it right after college or in their mid twenties. I had my, my quarter life crisis, you know, nearing the age of 30. Now I may not live to, you know, 120 <laughs> years old, but I think that's still quarter life at heart. And that's kind of when you're figuring out what you want to do with your life. So yeah, I, for me, it was kind of this existential feeling, not just, you know, in my head, but somatically right in my body of, who am I? What do I want? Feeling unhappy with what I was doing, feeling out of place. Um, that sense of going to work and being like, oh, I don't know if I want to be here. I'm wearing this suit. You know, and I had, a, I had a government job, so I was wearing a suit and tie, Washington, D.C., kind of a pretty um, traditional work environment and 
you know, this sense of looking out the conference floor window from the eighth floor, just like being like, what am I doing here? You know? And it's not like I had an awful job, you know, it's a Peace Corps is a great place. There's some great people there. I love some of my colleagues that they do great work in the world. I think a lot of people think that you can only have a quarter life crisis if you work for some sort of evil corporation yeah. or, you know, you're just kind of scanning a document, you know, at the copy machine all day long doing something really rote and boring, but you can have a quarter life crisis in a job that other people want, you know? I know people that are artists that have quarter life crisis crises. I know people that work at Google that have quarter life crises or people that work at Airbnb or really cool companies. It's all good. It's really a matter of one of the biggest things I've learned is that, um, you know, meaning is personal, right? Stop comparing yourself to others. Start figuring out why you're here. What do you want? What do you care about? Right? What are your dreams? What are your passions? What does meaning mean to you? Not your friends on Instagram or Facebook, not your family members, not your boss, not your coworkers. Why are you here? Like, what's your why? And I hadn't done that, you know? And I, I think that that is a pretty powerful thing. You know, you get to the age of 30 um, and I had gone to a, a good school. I went to Wesleyan University. It's a liberal arts college, um, really great school. I had worked in the film industry. I'd worked in politics, got to DC, kind of, had it on paper, like it all worked on LinkedIn or my resume, but internally in my body, I didn't know what the hell I was doing, which I imagine a lot of people feel because no one really teaches you that. You don't really learn that in college. You don't really learn that in your 20s, even your 30s. A lot of people are just kind of going through the motions on autopilot, you know, oh yeah, I got the salary, I get the paycheck, direct deposit, woo. Yep. But then every now and then just stop to say like, am I actually enjoying this? Is this what I want to be doing? Um, you only have one life. And I'm so grateful that I kind of had that wake up call. Um, for me, it was really the wake up call happened from being around other people in their 20s and 30s, other millennials that had either already had their quarter life crisis, <laughs> or were also going through it. So I met a lot of people on the other <clears throat> side that had been like, because I, you know, my biggest fears were, you know, this job's great. What, what if I quit? And then I don't find anything else, right? What if I quit? What if I, you know, leave DC and my dream was to move to San Francisco and become a writer. And what if I fail? Like, what if it doesn't work out? And a buddy of mine that I met Evan, um, I had gone to this leadership program called starting block, the starting block Institute for social innovation. It brings together social entrepreneurs and young people that are interested in using business for good. And I met this guy, Evan, at this program, and he said, Smiley, why would you be doing anything less than reaching your full potential? Oh, that just is so good. Right? So simple. And I was like, and we were having a beer on top of the, uh, on a rooftop on the uh, top of the Shangri-La Hotel in LA in Santa Monica, which is a beautiful like rooftop, you know, bar, you oversee the Pacific Ocean. It's gorgeous. And I was like, yeah why would I be doing anything less than reaching my full potential in life? And no one had really ever asked me that, right? People had asked me like, you know, where do you work? What do you do? How much money do you make? What's your five-year, 10-year career plan? Blah, blah, blah. You know, how are you moving up the ladder? But no one had ever asked, why would you be doing anything less than reaching your full potential? And once I, frame, once I kind of started to frame it like that, of why would I be doing anything less than my full potential? And I realized, okay, cool. Yeah, I have this job. I'm making some money. It looks good on paper, but I'm, I know, because I the only person that can answer that is yourself. I know I'm not reaching my full potential. I know because I'm not excelling. I'm not stoked to wake up in the morning every day. You're not I'm thriving. Not so, <laughs> I'm not thriving. I'm not yeah. thriving. And if that's the case, then it's my responsibility to do something about it. Uh, and switch it up. So then I realized, well, I can't really fail <laughs> because anything that's different than this, anything that's a new opportunity is going to be something different, something special, a learning opportunity. It's also going to be on the path to thriving, on the path to happiness, on the path to something, also on the path to impact, right? It's really hard to be impacting the lives of others if you're not thriving yourself. So that is the best decision single-handedly that I may have made in my life was making a career change essentially at the age of 30. So that's why I called my first book, The Quarter Life Breakthrough, not The Quarter Life Crisis, right? So I had a quarter life crisis, but I turned it into a breakthrough. I, th I think of it as a moment of 
po a positive moment of possibility of opportunity of, of change of growth um, and out of kind of this this crisis this fomo this sense of dread comes something beautiful comes comes something new and so making that jump and 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 leaving my job in dc and moving across the country to san francisco and starting this whole new career as a writer at the age of 30 you know which is old but like not that old, old. yeah <laughs> <laughs> it was the best thing i've ever done because now in the last you know eight years or so i've i've now written uh three books technically four books because i've self-published quarter life breakthrough and then got a book deal to rewrite it um and I've, you know, been able to touch the lives of millions of people simply because I took the leap and I, I went for it. Um, so I'm grateful to, I'm, I'm happy, proud of myself for doing that, but I'm also grateful to people like Evan that kind of held me accountable and pushed me over the ledge there. You know, you need people in your corner, um, whether you're an entrepreneur starting a business, whether you're starting a new project at work or trying to make a career change, you need people in your corner uh, to support you. You can't do this stuff alone. For sure. And I can fully empathize and appreciate uh, the position that you were in, in terms of that feeling of, okay, well, everyone around me is doing this one thing and is on this path that is supposed to be the enviable ladder to success and just knowing it wasn't right for you. Because I went to the Wharton School at UPenn and I saw that right. constantly where it was like, if you weren't gunning for one of the top five consulting firms, it was like, what are you doing with your life? And I was like, well, I would rather, like I just knew from the start, I'm like, I would literally rather uh, watch grass grow than do accounting every single day of my life. <laughs> and people thought I was crazy when I would, when I started my blog back in college. And they're like, what are you, like, what are you here for? What are you doing? Like, this is, this is a joke. And I hope that all my peers are happy and doing their doing their thing and are fulfilled and thriving in their own lives. But I'm like, oh, my God, I'm so glad that I pursued what I was actually interested in simultaneously, because now it's become the business that I have now. And I still to this day, I'm like, I would I would never in a million years be at some accounting firm pushing paper. It's just so not me. So I'm like, right. But it's hard. Like you said, it's so hard because everyone around you, it's like this vacuum of, but this is right. what's successful and this is what makes you good and worthy. And if you're not interested in that, it means you're not as smart as everybody else. So you're not as whatever. And it just means you're different. It's totally not a bad thing at all. I, I think it's a positive. I mean, I think yeah. it's an incredible thing to be able to look around and say, you know what, that's not for me or... I, I don't want to do that because it means you're critical, like a critical thinker and yeah. you're deciding who you are and what you want. And you're taking the time to really understand yourself and, and be self-aware and know yourself, which is, I think one of the most important things we can do in this life is to know who we are and know what we want and know the types of people we want to surround ourselves with and actually think and take the time to really understand what do we want and, and why are we here and what is, you know, the gifts we can have. And yeah, if, if that it means working for Deloitte or McKinsey or Accenture, amazing. And maybe that's in service to doing something else later. Everyone is different. Great. But for many of us, that's just not going to be the case mm -hmm. and that's okay. And it's also okay if you're still searching. I think that that's the other thing we don't talk about. You know, a lot of you know, we assume that people need to have it all figured out or because you majored in something in college or you got a degree in something that that's what you have to do. But the actual data points to, you know, the average millennial will have 15 or 20 different jobs in their lifetime. Only 25% of people end up doing something that's related to what they majored in in college. And that's so unique to our generation too, because a lot of our parents were in the generation of right. you are in the same career, maybe even the same job or the same role at the same company for sometimes decades, which is like, so not what our generation does. So it's really incredible. Yeah, it's, that's just not it. You know, now, you know, the average person, the average millennial is staying in their job about two to three years, even less. The average person of any age is staying in their job just about four years. So it's, it's not even just millennials at this point, it's everyone because mm -hmm. of the changing nature of how we work, of technology changing so quickly and the global job market. It's just not like that anymore. So I yeah. really encourage people, um, you know, we used to have kind of the career ladder mindset, you know, the ladder moves up one direction, it's linear. You get on it at some point when you're young, college, early 20s, you kind of work your way up step by step entry level position, move up higher, higher, higher. And at some point, you know, you're 60, 65, you can retire and, you know, play golf or 
tennis or whatever you do and then have a happy life or something in retirement. And there's like, you know, you get to the top and suddenly you're successful then. But actually, I encourage people to think of their career much more as a lily pad, pond of lily pads, the lily pad mindset where the lily pads are spread out in all directions. They're all connected by their roots. That's kind of what's meaningful to you, who you are, what you care about, what your purpose is. Um, but you can hop from different lily pads depending on what you're interested in and what you're good at and what you want to do. It doesn't mean you quit your job every two days. That's a real, probably a recipe for being pretty unhappy and also unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> but it means that you kind of have to be growing and constantly evolving and changing both in terms of learning and growth, but also uh, in terms of success that you can't just kind of pick a track and go like this because that's not how the world works anymore. You have to be adapting and trying and experimenting and trying new things and growing. Mm -hmm. And that that's actually proven to be kind of what, what people want is much more of that too. So um, I think that that's the, that's the, really the new model for careers. Yeah. You mentioned uh, the importance of who you surround yourself with. And since you also mentioned Evan, and I know you talk about this in your TED talk too, can you talk about um, how you believe in surrounding yourself with believers and what that, what that means and what that looks like. Sure. Um, yeah. So I think community is everything and that gets into a little bit of my, my newest, my new book, friendship in the age of loneliness, but you know, who we surround ourselves with is everything because when you find believers, you also find accountability. So when I was back in BC and I didn't like my job, I had a roommate um, Dan, who I would kind of complain to be like, I don't like want to do this anymore. I don't think I want to work for the government anymore. I'm, I'm ready to leave. I want to become a writer, do something else. And Dan would kind of look at me. He'd roll his eyes. He'd kind of take a swig of beer. He'd take another swig of beer, <laughs> roll his eyes and kind of say, smiley, suck it up, man. Everyone hates their job. It's part of life. So like Dan, cool dude, but just wasn't a believer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Has Dan like, seen your TED Talk since then? <laughs> He's like, oh man. I haven't talked to Dan in a while. We, we weren't, yeah, I haven't talked to Dan in a while. Um, you know, not, not a believer. It was kind of just like, you know what? Suck it up. You're not supposed to like your job. You just do it to make money. Have a beer after work. Go again on Monday. That's what you do. And a lot of people think like Dan, right? you know, like no fault of Dan, like it's, he's a product of the society we live in. 70% of Americans are disengaged with their jobs. 70%. So a lot of people assume that that's not what you're supposed to think. And then I went to that program I mentioned starting block where I found believers, where I found people that were like, wait a second, Smiley, you, you don't like your job. You, you want to become a writer. You want to move across the country. You want to start supporting people that are going after their dreams and young people like you have to do that because if you don't do it, who the hell is going to do it? Because a crazy thing happens when you find believers, you also find accountability. People like Evan texted me every single day after that program when I was like, you know what? I think I'm going to quit my job. I hadn't yet though. And he, he texted me every single, every single day. Smiley, have you had the talk with your boss yet? Have you had the talk with your boss yet? Have you had the talk with your boss yet? He'd even call me <laughs> on the phone, just straight up, like random call Tuesday, three o'clock in the afternoon. Smiley, have you? I was like, dude, I'm at work. Like I'm at the White House. Like, you know, like, you, you, what are you doing, man? You're going to get me like arrested or something. Like, stop calling me. But because he kept pushing me and calling me, I eventually did have that talk with my boss. I sat down. I made that pretty wild decision to leave a really good job and a good career path almost at the age of 30 and move across the country 3,000 miles away with two suit, like a suit, two bags, <laughs> you know, and a Frisbee to start a whole new life in San Francisco and everything that's happened to me since and all of the people that I've touched and all of the work I've done is because of believers is because of people like Evan and all the people I met at that program that held me accountable. So that's the power of believers, because if you think you can do it alone, it's going to be really hard because, you know, as soon as I got back from that program, I was like, well, maybe I'll stay or I'll save up some more money or now's the right, not the right time. Or maybe I'll think about this again in the fall or whatever. You keep kind of like making excuses, making excuses. Anyone that's, you know, stayed in a job too long knows that they've made excuses or you stay in a relationship too long or whatever. We've all been there. That's why you need those believers that are in your corner that are like, you said you wanted to break up with this person like six months ago. Like you need to do that right? You said you hated your job. Like you need to quit. You said you were going to write a book. Like how come you haven't written it yet? 
you said you were going to launch that product on Kickstarter. You said you were going to, you know, start your own clothing line, whatever it is. You got it. Like believers are the people that are going to help make it happen. I mean, you're going to eventually do it, but you need those people in your corner. Um, yeah, yeah. That, that it's, it's everything. I, I, yeah. and also I think it's not just in terms of getting things done and making things happen. It's happiness, right? That's the thing about this with friendship and, and connection. A lot of the data shows that the people that are happiest, healthiest, living the longest have thriving social relationships that that's the biggest determinant. There's actually research that was done about this at Harvard that found that the key to a long life, that the most of the people that um, were the healthiest at the age of 80 had the best social relationships at the age of 50, right? It had nothing to do with their wealth, how much money, success, power, influence, how many times they'd been on the cover of Fast Company, New York Times, NBC, Glamour, Cosmo, uh uh how many people they had in their life that they cared about, they cared about them. That's it, which is so simple. <laughs> it's free also, by the way, that doesn't cost yeah. any money, but it's time, it's energy and tension. It's hard, right? So that, that, that's really, you know, that's everything. Social relationships are the key to a long and happy life. One of the most simple things, but it's really hard. And we've seen the last, the last year, right? With the pandemic, actually how hard it truly can be. So um, it, but it's important to come back to that, just to remember at the end of the day, what we're talking about here is believers and finding more believers and supporting more people in your life and finding those people that are going to be in your corner. Mm -hmm. Have you found, have you found any differences between believers and your regular friend circle, so to speak? Because I'm sure we've all come into contact with our friends who might've been there for years, but they're not necessarily the biggest believers or their, their attitude is just not necessarily like that. And we don't necessarily want to completely nix them from our lives, but there's, especially as we grow and if we are that more, more of that believer tendencies in ourselves, I think the older we get, the more dissonance kind of starts to arise there. So I guess like, what's your advice between for A, finding believers and attracting more of them in your circle and B, maybe navigating your existing friendship circle and creating some boundaries or some space if there are some people who, okay, they're good friends for something, they're good friends for a beer on a Friday night, but like right. they're not, they're not a believer. Right. Yeah, I think that that's the big thing is that you have different friends for different purposes. Right. And, you know, sometimes we have friends that have been there for different times in our life. Maybe it was college. Maybe it was that, you know, first apartment or first place we lived in our 20s or, you know, we just moved to Philly or we just moved to Austin or Seattle or Boston or whatever. And we had a couple of friends that were getting us going. We don't want to necessarily drop them, but we have to recognize what purpose they serve in our life and what purpose they don't. And I think the key with believers is that there's something more there. They're kind of helping you. Um, you know, whether you want to call it achieve, you know, purpose or um, dreams or making you a better person. They have kind of your best interests at heart. Um, they see your North Star. They ask you what your North Star is and they help you get there. Um, and friends, it's a little bit different. Friends, you want to be there for you and want to love you, but they, 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 it might be serving a different purpose. It might be just, hey, these are my people that I work out with. They, I do yoga with, I go for a run with, we are, we're on the same soccer team, we go to the gym together, something like that. That's cool. That's a friendship. That's great. That's different than kind of, you know, the person that's like, I'm making sure that you start this business or write this book. Um, so, you know, in terms of where to find believers, I always say kind of put yourself in an environment that's going to challenge you. I think that that's really the place, like if you're like, oh, I'm kind of scared about taking this class, right? Maybe it's an online class or maybe it's a, a, an in-person class, cooking class, uh, uh, writing a book, uh, starting a business, uh, salsa dancing, whatever. Putting yourself in an environment like that is a place where you're probably going to meet somebody that's going to push you because you're going outside your comfort zone. You're trying something new and other people are probably trying something new too. So immediately you have that kind of shared vulnerability right? You're both kind of being a little bit, this is a little hard for me. Like I'm going for it. I'm putting myself out there. I'm scared. I'm scared too. Right. Oh, we're both scared. Let's be friends. Like, <laughs> I believe in you. You believe in me, right? There's a little bit of a realness there. So I think uh, places where you can put yourself outside your comfort zone 
places that you're meeting people that are different than you, right? So diverse groups of people, whether it's gender, age, background, race, ethnicity. Um, one of the cool things about starting block was I was around all these people that were younger than me, right? I, younger and older. So I was, I was in my late twenties, kind of like, I'm too old for this. You know, what's this 18 year old going to teach me, right? What's this 21 year old going to teach me? And I was like, oh my God, these kids are amazing. <laughs> you know, the, these Gen Zers are all over it. Like they're next level, like they're activists and organizers and entrepreneurs. And they've already like gotten, you know, a million dollars in venture funding. Like, holy, sh you know, like they're out there, like they're making it happen. I have so much to learn from them. Right. Rather than just being like, I'm 30 years old. I know everything. Right. <laughs> or I'm 40. I'm, I have it all figured out. It's like, we don't all have it all figured out. Right. No one has it figured out. Um, and so put yourself in places where people are a little bit different than you. And then I also think kind of focus on um, creative output. Right. Um, is always going to be a place where believers are believers love creativity. Believers are makers too. Right. So whether it's whatever your thing is, right, whether it's, uh, you know, starting a podcast, building a website, start launching a product, writing a book, sharing your art, learning to cook, um, learning design, those types of environments are going to be places where you're likely to meet more believers because they're naturally artists, creatives, entrepreneurs. Yeah. So since your latest book is um, Friendship and, you know, the Age of Loneliness, I would love to hear if you have found anything to be particularly helpful in fostering real connections beyond Zoom, <laughs> whether yeah. that's with coworkers or with friends, since obviously the last year has been, you know, kind of a big deal in the global pandemic. Uh, but <laughs> since we're now, since there's maybe some light at the end of the tunnel, and now we might be transitioning off of Zoom back offline for some connections, a, you know, some ways for connecting beyond Zoom in a really good, meaningful way, and maybe how to start that transition comfortably back to, right. oh, like in-person communication. Yeah. I mean, I think this is such a unique time. For sure. So first and foremost, like accepting that and recognizing it and just being like, you know, it's almost like equating to kind of like being around a swimming pool and you're a kid and like some people are diving right in off the diving board. Some like, people are doing ya. a belly flop. <laughs> They're like, I'm in baby, let's go. And some people are going to kind of like wade in slowly or do like two strokes and get out. And like some people are just chilling on the lawn chair being like, I'm just having my lemonade and I'm chilling. Like I'll I'm zoom me on the other side. <laughs> yeah. I'll be like on my computer and, and talking to you and just recognizing like, that's okay. That's all good. And actually naming it and being like, this is uncomfortable. This is a little awkward. How are we going to do this? And realizing that we're all at different places, we're all at different comfort zones. And frankly, everyone basically based on where they live or their personal situation or their family situation is actually in a different place when it comes to safety um, and, and how they're going to deal with kind of what I'm calling the friendship awakening, right? The friendship kind of reentry. And so let's name it, let's say, cool, it's okay. And let's give everyone the benefit of the doubt and say, hey, this is what I'm available for. What are you available for? What are you interested in, right? Immediately making not about like, this is the right way, this is the wrong way. Where are you at? Here's where I'm at. Here's where I'm at, where are you at? So making it a conversation and kind of entering that conversation from a place of compassion, I think is important. In terms of actually... Um, the re-entry itself, I would say starting with ritual is so important, right? Making something a recurring ritual. We know that increased connection is going to lead to making it deeper. There's a psychological principle known as the mere exposure effect, where the more you see someone, the more you are likely to enjoy them. Um, so if you immediately say, you know, rather than planning kind of a one-off event or let's get drinks, you can kind of say, hey, should we start a wine club? Should we do a book club? Do we maybe let's take this cooking class together or do let's do a, a monthly dinner party to welcome everyone together post pandemic um, so that it's not just a one off thing, but it becomes this place where maybe it's just, you know, a crew of of your six girlfriends uh, where you're all getting together, but you have it. Oh, you know that the next one's also happening. And you're like, OK, you host this one. And then in June, this person's going to host. Right. And immediately it creates that thing that you're looking forward to. And already it's kind of gets that heartbeat going. So whether it's a dinner party, a, a girl's weekend, a boy's trip, um, 
uh, a class, um, that type of thing, I think is great. Um, I think the another thing I would say is uh, correspondence rituals, I think are a great way to kind of get in touch with people. Um, you don't have to be good at everything, writing letters, picking up the phone and calling, sending texts, video messages, but find one that you are good at, right? I don't think it's okay. You, you have to figure out which which kind of, what is your correspondence habit that, you, that you're good at, that you enjoy, pick that and double down on it, right? I know people that are all about the audio message. I'm not a big audio message person, but people love it. And they send it. I think it's so great to just say, you know, I was thinking about you. You came into mind. I, here's what I'm, I, I wanted to update you on what's happening in my life. I'd love to make a plan to hang out. Or if they, they live far away, just kind of telling them that you're thinking about them. Um, I think that that's a great, just coming up with kind of a correspondence ritual um, is beautiful. I'd also say just looking for more opportunities to connect in your community, especially since that for now, we're probably going to be spending still a lot of time in our immediate neighborhoods or cities for better or for worse. We can start to travel a little bit. It looks like this summer, which is great, but just reconnecting with your community. I call it be, be a minister for loneliness in your community. So getting to know a few people in your neighborhood has actually been proven to combat loneliness and make you feel much more connected and, and more purpose-driven in your own home and place. So whether that's getting to know, you know, folks in your coffee shop, uh, volunteering in your neighborhood, um, starting a kind of neighborhood potluck uh, series where people are just getting together and you're inviting people that you don't know or people on your block or people that you haven't met yet is a great way to just kind of say, hey, let's, you know, it's been a long year. We can finally see each other's faces, <laughs> our faces now, right? I mean, we've had masks on. This, most, of, most people have had masks on for almost a year and a half. <laughs> so yeah, we just need a lot. We need some time together. Uh, and I think that that's a great way to do that. For sure. I know my cul-de-sac did that uh, when the pandemic oh, was beautiful. happening. We had we had literally just moved into our new house and it was the, the day we moved in, we were like, oh, we're going to like it here because everyone in the cul-de-sac had come out and socially distanced their lawn chairs around the edge of the cul-de-sac and they put a big margarita maker in the middle of it and they were like we're we're just gonna shout across and get to know each other since we can't go anywhere else and now everyone was in one of our neighbors is getting married in costa rica in the beginning of 2022 and the whole cul-de-sac's invited like oh it, that's awesome it was it like it works but i love also how you mentioned calling it out and really being okay being vulnerable to call out the awkwardness of something because i feel like we hit this point in adulthood where we think oh we're too old to make new friends or we should already have our friends our friend circle whatever and then we kind of secretly want more friends or want some community in our new spaces in our new seasons right. in life but we're afraid to actually we're afraid to seem lame or seem weird or seem like we're the I don't know like the the weird loner who should have a circle but doesn't so I think it's so cool to just be able to be like you know what I get that this is like kind of awkward whatever but would love a new like would love a new mom friend at preschool or whatever to just like acknowledge the awkwardness but also kind of bridge the gap right away and open the door for conversation and connection when otherwise like the alternative is it just doesn't happen so why yeah, not exactly and, and everything everyone's going through it too mm -hmm. right nearly two thirds of Americans are lonely, right? So it's not just you, <laughs> right? So naming it and saying it, being like, I'd like deeper friendships. I want more intentional relationships. I wanna spend more time with people. Oh, cool, me too, right? Suddenly you realize you're not alone. And by naming it, you're giving permission for other people to share their experience and to share their feelings, which is gonna create more acceptance. So it's actually sure. a pretty vulnerable and bold thing to do to step out and say, hey, like even to even, I think actually that's a great use of social media is to actually kind of say, hey, like I'm looking for deeper relationships. I'm looking for more friendships. If, if you are too, maybe we can create a woman's circle, uh, you know, a group, uh, you know, an activity club, something like that, uh, because I'm sure other people are too. You know, one of the best ways we can use technology is to kind of create meaningful offline connections. So you're using the technology to meet people, but then you're not just kind of staying there scrolling forever. You're actually using it to meet up in real life or to make a plan or to build something to, together, to create something together. That's a beautiful way of using these apps. And there's so many of them now, not just kind of, you know, you would think of the traditional social media apps, but there's so many apps out there that are designed for people to make new friends. 
right? I mean, Bumble has a Bumble BFF, Bumble BFF you, know, yep. with a, you know, place to meet new friends. There's Meetup, there's Nextdoor. Um, there's all these places where they're, whole, they're all designed to kind of meet interesting people that live near you or that share similar interests and then actually connect with them. Social media to be social instead of right. sitting in a corner at a bar on your phone being extraordinarily antisocial. Right. Awesome. Well, uh, Smiley, can't thank you enough for being on Thrive. want to close out by asking you uh, two questions that I ask all guests, and I feel like this is going to be right up your alley, but I would love to know, what does Thrive mean to you, and how do you strive to thrive in your everyday life? Mm -hmm. Great question. Um, to me, for me, thriving means my community is thriving. If, if the people in my life that I care about, that I've um, supported along the way that have reached out to me for advice that have helped me, that have advised me, that have supported me. If those people are thriving, I'm thriving. So I really, as I kind of build my career, um, you know, I'm trying to get book deals and get gigs and speak. That's yeah, that's my business. And I really try to support other people in my life in, in getting book deals and writing their books and getting more talks. So I, I've really dedicated a lot of my time and energy towards other people thriving and not just the, anyone randomly, but especially kind of my people, my believers, my community. Um, it's kind of like, you know, I, it's akin to like, you know, people in the mu music business are like, you know, like if a rapper gets kind of comes up, like they bring their whole crew, right? Like if a musician, you know, gets to be in that band, like they probably kind of get like their friend's band is to be the opening act on the bill, right? Like that's how you roll, like that's how you do it. So I'm kind of trying to do that in the, the millennial <laughs> thought leadership world. It's not quite the same as the hip hop industry or, um, or rock and roll, but you know, that's, that's my definition of thriving. And uh, I hope that I, that's how I kind of hope to, 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 to do that as, as I progress in my career to the future. That's awesome. So tell everyone where they can find you online if they want to connect with you more or pick up a copy of your book. Yeah. So please uh, connect with me on my website and subscribe for my newsletter on Substack, smileypazwalski.com. You can find all my stuff on my <laughs> website. Um, I'm on Instagram at what's up smiley. And you can buy the book Friendship in the Age of Loneliness uh, on Amazon or wherever you buy books. Wait, before you go, make sure you're subscribed to never miss an episode of Thrive. Drop five stars on your way out if you like what you just listened to. And come join the party on Instagram at thrive.podcast to stay inspired and thriving all week long. Thanks for tuning in. It's your time to thrive.